Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. I am joined today by my friend, my colleague in arms, my collaborator, my co-conspirator, the director of digital and storytelling for Braver Angels, Monica Guzman. Monica, welcome. Hey, hey, it is so good to be here. Stranger, it is so good to be here. Uh, yeah, let's it do is this. Always, it is always good to see you. And this is a big week for you because your new book is out. It is called, I Never Thought of It That Way, how to have fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. The book came out on Tuesday. The New York Times reviewed it. You're about to leave tomorrow for a book tour. You're doing podcasts. You're doing media. So I'm very glad that I get to talk to you before you leave on this crazy adventure. And my first question is, you write with such a personal and powerful voice in this book as somebody who grew up as the daughter of two Mexican immigrants who voted for Donald Trump twice. You're somebody who leans more liberal. This is a searing divide for so many people, but particularly when it's your parents. Mm. And I imagine particularly when it touches upon issues of race, class, background. Can you talk a little bit about how that relationship with your parents kind of shaped this book? Yeah, the the first sort of spark for it that connects to my relationship with my parents was the presidential campaign in 2015 into the 2016 election and then immediately following. So I live in Seattle. It's a very blue place politically. I'm blue myself. And I would be in conversations with people who shared my political leanings and I'd watch the conversations. You remember, those were really anxious times, especially for liberals, right? Like in particular for liberals. Yes, I and was on the Clinton the campaign, would, so I certainly yeah. remember. <laughs> oh yeah, and Seattle was dead the morning of November 9th. Was it 9th or 10th? It was dead. But anyway, I would be in these conversations and, and we would have more political conversations than really we ever had. And it would, it would inevitably go to Trump. And then from there, it would often go to the people who voted for Trump. And when it got to that, that's where something in my heart kind of jumped a bit because, oh boy, what are people going to say? And they would say a lot of what was in the media, a lot of what was in many people's minds, you know, that these people, people who voted for someone they think is a monster must be a monsters themselves. And I would hear people say these things, not, not like flat out, like, ah. You know, but, you know, but that subtle dehumanization, that, that condescension that happens. And it just kind of awoke something in me where I know that that's not true because I love my parents because I know my parents and I happen to know their reasons because I've had conversations with them that have been very difficult, but that have allowed me to understand their vote and why, where it came from and why it was very natural for them. It allowed their vote to make sense to me and for me to see them as people no matter what, why wouldn't I? And so that was the main spark. That's where, that's where my relationship with them sort of led to, I got to do something about this. I've got to do something. But it goes back, obviously, a long time. I mean, I've known them my whole life. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it didn't. What's interesting, though, is that America is an adopted country for us. I became a citizen when I was 17 in the year 2000, at the same time that my parents got naturalized, because when you're under 18, you're automatically naturalized. And I remember the ceremony and I remember how dang proud my parents both were. Uh, they were really into it, you know? And um, watching them study, they loved watching Seinfeld and they would skip episodes of Seinfeld to study for the citizenship test. Like, it's really interesting as an immigrant to choose America. It's, you know, and, and it's an experience mm -hmm. that folks who are born here don't have. And it's, it's fascinating to be a part of that. Anyway, so soon after, they became citizens. That's when suddenly voting became a thing for them. And that was the 2000 election. And I saw the Bush Cheney sign appear on a bulletin board over my mother's desk. And that was when, that was really the first time I really understood they're Republicans. 
and I was in high school, but I had gotten these signals. I watched CNN headline news every afternoon after school. I'd gotten these signals that, oh, you're Mexican, you're an immigrant, you're Latin American, you're probably Democrat. Although Bush actually didn't pull that that poorly with Hispanics, but that was sort of the assumption I had. They must be, they must be like me. They must feel politically like me. That's when we realized that we did not match each other politically. Uh, and I could say more, but obviously it's been it's been a roller coaster with them of conversations, but we're able to talk about it. Hmm. And taking an even broader lens, do you think that you've always been a curious person? I think that curiosity is usually considered a virtue, but there's also the expression curiosity killed the cat. Yeah. And I think people also grow up wary of being too curious. What was that like for you? I mean, I've known you now maybe two or three years, and I've always Mm -hmm. considered you to be a very naturally curious and inquisitive person. Were you like that as a kid? Yeah. Um, you know, I've had to reflect on this a lot. I, I am not all the way convinced that curiosity is something that some people have naturally and others don't. I, I, so far in my research, I just don't see a lot of evidence for that, but, but I, but I am also an observant human being. And I would agree there are people in my life who seem more naturally curious. And I've been told And I will accept that I'm a very naturally curious person, whatever that means. But when I reflect on it, I think about being a kid, uh, moving to the United States when I was five and a half or six years old and having to accommodate a different culture and constantly kind of noticing, right? Oh, the ways that we did this in school in Mexico are not not the ways we're doing things here. Hmm. And, and, And I would... So, so in other words, it's like, I did sort of have two worlds and I was in this unique position of being able to compare and contrast them all the time and then wonder, well, why? I'm also bilingual. And so there's studies about bilingualism about, you know, when, when you have two ways to say the same thing, you start to notice little patterns and get kind of fascinated by how things compare and contrast. I tell a story in the book, I never thought of it that way from third grade, where, (laughs) friend of mine named Jessica and I were playing at her house and we were like drawing on a chalkboard or something. And I got to talking about, about Mexico. Uh, I was saying how we drive around and you could see the mountains, you know, from the, from the road. And I could kind of tell where I was based on which mountain I could see. And she just stops me and goes, they have paved roads in Mexico. And this was in New Hampshire. And I was the only Hispanic Latin American person in my school. And that moment, like, I still remember, it just stunned me. Now, Jessica, all she really knew about Mexico, I think, like, all that that the kids there, like, knew was um, Speedy Gonzalez, you know? And in fact, that was my nickname. (laughs) Like, other kids gave me that nickname because I would finish my tests really fast. (laughs) And I would walk up to the, you know, the front of the classroom and put them down. So I was Speedy Gonzalez, and that's what we knew. And Speedy Gonzalez, there are no paved roads. There are paved roads in Mexico. And so I, I think I, I remember learning in that moment the very, the very fundamental truth that people can't really know what they don't know. They can't know what they haven't experienced. And that then, you know, I just said, yeah, they have paved roads in Mexico. Sure, they have restaurants and stores and malls, Jessica. Like, it's just like this. And she goes, okay, and just kept drawing. And so I think there was something about that. There was something about, about not everything around me always feeling natural, but actually feeling different and me being different to other people in some ways that opened up all these gaps in my experience that then I could fill in by asking questions. You know, a gap between what, what I know and what I don't know. I filled in other people's gaps. I'd be like, oh, you know, this is how you say this in Spanish or whatnot. It happened to be a really fascinating, interesting experience for me. I know, you know, difference can be really charged and even traumatic, um, but, but for me, it, it actually was fascinating. Mm. For people who grew up in more homogenous environments, who weren't necessarily exposed to difference through necessity, before we talk about how these people and anyone really can be more curious, I'd like to hear a little bit about why we should be curious. What do people get from being curious and what do they miss out on by not being curious? Mm. So 
there's a way to answer this question in context, which is kind kind of how I'd prefer to start at least, and that's the context of our world right now. You know, I'm in Braver Angels because I think that there is a red alert going on with how toxically divided things are. I know you agree. <laughs> that's why we're here. That's why we're doing this work. And what I've what I've really come to believe is that. If you can't get curious across divides in a polarized world, you can't see the world at all. Um, we've seen the social science research about misperceptions, that when people look across the divide and are asked to estimate or guess what people's perspectives are on certain issues, we're way off. It's like a funhouse mirror. We are way off. So we can argue about why. There's obviously media and communication and technology, whatever. There's all these dynamics, fear and anxiety. But the truth is that we are in this reality distortion field when we look at people who disagree with us. And so just right there, I think is a fundamental benefit. Get curious so that you can see. <laughs> we're so divided, we're blinded. It's, it's not comfortable to admit that or acknowledge that, but it's true. You know, and unfortunately in response, what a lot of people are doing um, is, is what's a little bit easier and what I can't blame anyone for doing, which is, you know, more conservatives are moving to conservative areas and away from liberal areas and liberals are moving to more liberal areas. And we see that, you know, the blue zip codes getting bluer, the red zip codes getting redder. Uh, the, the easier solution to this, the more comfortable one is just, gosh, this is all so annoying and irritating and frustrating and nobody can see me when I'm different. I'm gonna go and be around people who are the same. Um, but it is making us blinder without, without the glue, right? Without, uh, the, the more that we keep burning these bridges, the less curious we can really be, the less we can open ourselves up to, to the other side, uh, the, the more blind we're gonna be. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that to me is what we miss out on when we're not curious is an accurate view of our world. I mean, that's what's happening. Um, you know, we talk about the lack of shared reality and, and you know, Usually people on either side are like, well, it's my side that has the monopoly on reality. It's the other side that doesn't. But actually, no, all, all sides, everybody, it doesn't matter where you are. None of us is seeing things as they really are because we are not, we are not as fluent and as knowledgeable with, about other people's perspectives as we need to be. And so I say, how can we pretend to be informed when we're not informed about people? And in terms of the affirmative case for curiosity, how do you experience the joy and enrichment and fulfillment and even delight that can come from cross-cultural and cross-partisan exchange? Because I feel like sometimes yeah. people hear it and they're like, oh, this sounds really hard. It's like eating my vegetables and like, I do want to see the world, but it's going to be like, yeah. really hard and gross and like but there's another side of it right that like you know in the right conditions it can actually be uh very rewarding it can but but i think it's it's worth dwelling on those conditions so the mm -hmm. short answer to, to that question is you need to not be you, you need to reduce the fear and that's very hard to do because there are valid reasons for many people to feel afraid uh we see, we see the loudest voices, the most partisan voices sometimes, not always. We see our politicians, we see our media get a lot of traction when they exploit the misperceptions, when they exaggerate, right? And we elevate stories of bad actors. Uh, we elevate all kinds of stories that make us think, yeah, that the other side is just devoid of any good. And we elevate that to ourselves. So of course we're afraid. Um, and again, it's not to say that it's all untrue. I mean, there are, there are people very consumed by hate out there. They do exist and they ought to be feared. But again, when we, when we look at it, when we do the research, we, we think that people despise us way more than they actually do. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've shown that, we've demonstrated that. So yes, yeah, so I think when people say that these are hard conversations, you, know, you and I hear that all the time, like, this is so hard, it's hard work. And that's always kind of bothered me because, okay, yes, something about it is hard, but what about it is hard? We need to be specific. And in my view, what's hard about it is the psychology, not the actual 
steps you can take to be curious in conversation. Just the psychology of approaching it openly. That's hard. But the only reason that's hard is because of the internal fears that and, and the, the, the things that we have come to believe about other people, you know? But mm -hmm. if you can come up to a person and say, this person is what's most important right now. Right now, in my conversation, this person is what matters. Let me find out about this person. Let me not get stuck on just their opinion that I saw. Let me look behind it. Let me look at who they are. Because our, our information landscape, our communication landscape just has really kind of brought up this ethic of opinions being who we are. You know, what somebody tweets is the, the whole person. And that's not true. The internet is a non-place that makes us into non-people. We have to get underneath that. That may be the place where we have most of our discussions, but most of those discussions are not really conversations. Um, and so if we can have conversations, contained ones, where we're not so afraid of what the ramifications might be, where we aren't tempted to perform to others, where we're actually focused on each other, that is not technically that hard. Just the psychology of approaching it will feel hard. But the key word there is it's a feeling. Hmm. I also sense that people have a fear that engaging with somebody who's not only different from them, but holds views they find fearful, they're afraid that engaging with that person, they'll somehow be losing a piece of themselves. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why that is? Because it does seem to be increasing. People feel yeah. even talking to this person, like I'm going to be somehow compromising yeah. my own identity. What do you think that's about? Well, part of it is that we do conflate opinions with people and we, we form really close attachments, you know, to the level of identity against certain ideas. You know, who I am is the person who does not believe that, right? And so just the act of asking someone about their view on that, asking the person, makes us think that we're already abandoning ourselves because we are committed to reject the idea they represent. So we think, well, if we reject the idea, but are open to the person, then we're open to the idea. Oh no, we've accepted the idea. But the problem there is that we have conflated the idea with the person. It's, it's an idea, it, it's a belief. You, you may not, you likely don't really see the whole idea, how it exists for this one person. You may, you may have impressions based on discussions, broader public ones about the idea, but, but you don't know it for that individual. You don't know it for that person. But, but yeah, so the first step is really just divorcing, divorcing the sense that when you, when you accept a person just by listening to them, because good listening does take acceptance. You have to think the other person is valid enough to have something to share with you that is valuable, right? So if when you look at that person, all you see is the awful idea, you can't do that. And, and you're gonna think that it's gonna harm you um, to do it. it. You're gonna think you've lost yourself. You've already rebelled. Um, but, but, you know, I, but I think like, it's just, to me, it's just time to look around and see the harm that comes when we have no glue anymore among people who have different ideas. You know, I think we often speak as if the harm comes from the ideas and that's the only source. And, and it, it can, sure, ideas inspire behaviors and behaviors can lead us to, to terrible places. But there is harm when we shut the door to everybody like this. We can see it, but we somehow aren't thinking of it as harm. It's harmful. Hmm. Yeah, that brings me to, I guess a couple questions I wanted to ask to sort of channel people who might be giving you pushback, which I'm sure you've gotten given mm -hmm. the topic and the times we're in. Uh, before this interview, I was checking out the comment section of the New York Times book review, and there's lots of people having interesting conversations on the comment board, which I think is great because that's sort of one of the goals of the book itself. And mm -hmm. I saw one comment that seemed to capture a certain strand of pushback. I'm just going to read it. It says, you need to draw a distinction between empathizing with different viewpoints mm -hmm. 
and tolerating political actions that are actively harming people. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between somebody who, for example, thinks homosexuality is wrong, but is kind and respectful to gay people, mm -hmm. and somebody who tries to take away gay people's basic human rights based on that belief. If you will agree to disagree, so will I. But if you are trying to harm or restrict the freedoms of the people you disagree with, I will have nothing to do with you. Yeah. Yeah. And you know who I, who I think of with that is Jonathan Rauch. I think he has talked about this because uh, Jonathan's a great thinker and writer. Um, and he was, you know, he was involved in the fight for rights for same sex, you know, couples and, and LGBTQ all over. And I, and I think about that because how can any movement for rights work if you don't approach the people in your way, if you don't allow yourself to be seen by them? So that, there's, there's a paradox there, right, that I want to unpack because the idea is, and I, and it's, I get it, it's, it's extraordinarily triggering and traumatic. It can be really psychologically hard, the hardest, right? to approach someone who, who it feels like is actively, th their ideas lead to behaviors, lead to patterns in your society. You see the link that are holding you back, that are keeping your group or yourself from thriving in this society. That sucks. That sucks, right? But I, but I would question, I would challenge the idea that the appropriate thing to do is to not have anything to do with those people. You can, you can decide that for yourself, sure, fine. And, and many people do, and that's great. But thank goodness that there are people who share your conviction about the rights that ought to be had, who will approach. Because when, when you do approach folks who seem to be holding you back, right? First, you understand what the deeper concern might be. Um, I know that these days we, we tend to think it's hate. It's hate. Anyone who stands against me and something I love it must be out of hate. That's not true. Now, sometimes it is, yes. But what I have learned from my experience is that many times when you get close, hate is not actually the totality of the motivation. And if you can learn a little more about what the deep discomfort or concern is, your movement will be more successful. So that's one thing is like, you gotta approach people just to do that. The other is, you know, we're so divided, we're blinded. We're not seeing each other. We have misperceptions. Well. Sometimes when people think that other people don't deserve what they see as, as rights, they probably have misperceptions. They probably see those other people in some caricatured way. We're doing that to each other in a lot of ways. So if no one in that group allows themselves to be seen fully, then we're just gonna dig a deeper hole. I just don't see how this plays out. You know what I mean? Again, I empathize fully with the individual decision. And I say this in the book, I am not here to tell everybody, go talk to a Nazi tomorrow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I am not here for that. No, <laughs> you know? like each of us has completely separate contexts and decisions and crossing divides. It's, it's a different psychological formula for each of us, totally. And, and it is not about, it's not about go and do the, the hardest thing you can, but each of us can do a little thing. Each of mm -hmm. us can go to the edges of wherever we happen to be and push a little more. We can do that. Do you think people with more power and privilege in society have greater responsibility to take the initiative to have these kinds of conversations? Yes, but I don't think that's an excuse for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, the reason I ask is because I think um, I can see why members of groups that have been historically marginalized or oppressed feel angry and frustrated that they are the ones who have to shoulder right. the burden right. and swallow their anger to be seen yeah. by people who have never had to deal with those challenges yeah. and whose very existence has been within a system that they can't even see. Yeah. And they're not, I would say they're not the only ones who have to shoulder the burden. I think there are many people who carry the compassion for other people who they are not exactly like, right? So I think the burden is quite shared. And I think the evidence is there for that. 
You know, we can choose to believe that it is all on us, but is it, I don't know, look around, like plenty of other people are doing this. So, but what I will say is, and this is the conundrum, and this is uncomfortable to hear, the person whose experience most represents the thing that needs to be fought for holds a very powerful place. And I know that the idea is that it's, it's actually not a powerful place. You hold a powerful place for understanding. Um, it might be too painful for you. That's okay. It might be too painful for you to go and be like analyzed and looked at and other people, you know, ew, I get it. <laughs> you, know, you may not want to do that. That's fine. Um, but, but if, but if your response is to shut yourself away, I'm only going to be around other people who get me because they share my experience a hundred percent, then it's going to be all that much harder for us to see ourselves in each other across a lot of different divides. But I don't know how we hold a society together that way. I really don't. Hmm. That makes total sense to me. The other piece of pushback I see, which touches upon the notion of harm is on the epistemological side. People say, having conversations with people I disagree with, even if I find their views harmful or misguided or disgusting, I can see the value in that. But when I'm talking to someone whose facts are completely wrong mm. and who's not even necessarily articulating a deeply held view, but is actively promoting misinformation mm. and harmful ideas that were planted by cynical bad faith actors to mm -hmm. confuse and divide and marginalize. Is it not true that having those conversations can actually advance those ideas by granting them legitimacy in the eyes of the public or a third mm -hmm. party or someone who doesn't quite know who to trust. Yes, and, and this is where context matters a lot. We, we tend to think about conversation as if it's all the same. It is so not all the same. In fact, right now, more than any time in history, we have a plethora of ways to have conversations, each of which limits our full human toolbox of communication, right? So I'm texting you with words and emojis, the occasional photo, but I'm calling you with my voice and my tone and my expression. Um, you know, and then being in person, goodness, like there's actually physical sensations from being together where we can almost sense each other's emotions and mirror neurons and cool stuff like that, right? So there's different contexts of conversation. The other, uh, the other sort of spectrum that matters hugely to your question is there's contained conversations, conversations that are contained to the people actually participating in them. And then there's conversations online happening in more open spaces. It's those places where we have to be really careful and responsible, right? If we're, if we're having a conversation and there's, if there's this invisible mass audience on our Facebook pages and wherever, we don't even know, like we, we don't often stop to think how weird it is to have conversations and not know who's listening. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll see a number. Oh, this tweet had 400 impressions. Great. Who? <laughs> who saw it? I don't know. So of course we're afraid of the consequences of those conversations. Um, yeah, but what I would say is, contained conversations, the one-to-one, -one, that's, where, that's where I don't think we need to be afraid about being responsible. And I know that sounds really weird. We should ask ourselves, what, what does it mean to be responsible in a one-to-one -one conversation, right? And obviously it means something, but you don't have to worry about what you are allowing to spread to others as much. So what's tragic I think today is that we often speak about conversations as if the only way we can have them is in uncontained social platforms, you know? mm -hmm. which is hilarious to me. It's like we pretend we don't, we're not human beings with lives and bodies and we have people in our lives we can talk to, or maybe we think that those conversations don't add up to anything, which is not true. We know at Braver Angels that's not true because the whole Braver Angels model is about small contained conversations, building trust. And then those revelations about other people inspiring conversations out in the world, inspiring new levels of empathy and curiosity when we do engage with other people on social media. And, and, and then you can go into social media and as long as you have that, that empathy and curiosity, social media can be a completely wonderful platform for productive conversation. But the problem is 
we don't tend to see people as people there. We only see their opinions and we fight them. Mm. And, and we're fighting ghosts. We're not, we're not fighting people. We're not seeing people. So, but we, but we can go, there's much more to say about what you were saying about active mistruths. So, so go ahead and like, well, yeah, I that, guess I would just yeah. ask, so is, is there any ways in which your advice would change if you're say talking to journalists yeah, exactly. who are creating exactly. and having conversations publicly? How does your advice 100%, change? hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I host a show here in Seattle and if someone, I, my, my role is to inform, there is a discipline of fact that, that comes into my work there. And I have to be extremely careful not to have people spout off things for which there is very little evidence. That's not responsible of me as a journalist. That is, that's in a very important part. That's a very important role that journalists play in our lives, right? Responsible storytellers. Many journalists have big platforms and, and so they have, to, they have to take that into account. I think that's really important. So the advice changes completely in a lot of ways. But I will say this, I will say this. Um, huh. You know, I do see you know, being a journalist, I keep a close watch on, on all the things going on in that space. And there is, there is a, a severe focus on facts and fact checking and misinformation and disinformation makes total sense. Um, but I do think that focusing so much on that begins to make us think that fact is truth. Fact is truth. If people reject fact, they reject truth. We cannot invite them into the search for collective truth. They are not worthy. If they disagree with these facts, then goodbye. We can't talk to them. They are harmful even to touch. They will infect me with their lies. That is not true because truth does not equal facts. What happens in the world matters. Our interpretation of what happens in the world matters more. It's, it's that, it's that interpretive level that matters more. And in that gray area of interpretive level, that's where we've lost a lot of trust. Um, and so I, I, I think of, you know, you've heard me say this before, but like we, we look to people to affirm a shared reality before they can earn our trust. But what if it takes trust to build a shared reality? So even in journalism circles, even in large platforms and large spaces where people are having conversations, if we never allow the modeling of listening, even to unsavory ideas so that we can get beneath them and explore where they come from so that we can understand together, if we don't platform the act of understanding, then how will anyone know how it works? Right. So if we don't allow, if, if all of that happens in one-to-one -one conversation, then it's great. I think that's an improvement. But if it only happens there and we never share it, then a lot of people will never think to do it. And, and I think that could be dangerous because again, there is harm in so much distrust in our society. That is, mm -hmm. that is a source of harm too, to all of us, marginalized groups and everyone else. No one's getting anything done. <laughs> You know, at a certain level, it's breaking, it's broken. We're not gonna fix it by saying, you don't agree with my facts, so goodbye. That's not, that's not gonna work all the way. Yeah, and it strikes me that in the media, there used to be institutional gatekeepers that had a much larger role in shaping the public conversation. So, certain ideas were considered so far out of the mainstream that the vast majority of America might not be exposed to them. Mm -hmm. In some ways now, it seems that the cat is out of the bag. You don't need to work at a mainstream media platform mm -hmm. to gain an audience. Right. And in fact, one of the best ways to gain an audience is to say a lot of crazy shit that's not true. Yeah. So. Yep. That's exploitative, you know, it's, and it's I, yeah, I understand I, that maybe the traditional argument that someone might make that is one of the best ways to defeat a bad idea is to just starve it of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, you do mm. that enough, the idea will, will go away. And yeah. I think about, you know, a lot of European countries uh, after World War II made it a law 
yeah. to ban Holocaust denial. That's right. With with the goal of saying, um, you know, even allowing people to do this could lead these ideas to spread. Yeah. How do you think about that now in a context where tens of millions of Americans believe in theories that mainstream media outlets and traditional arbiters of truth Mm -hmm. deem conspiracy theories? What is the role of us as individuals when we are talking to someone that we believe is been imbibing conspiracy theories? How should we approach that conversation first as an individual? And then how do you think journalists should do it, particularly given the cold reality that Donald Trump may be the Republican nominee for president again? And if he is, it's Mm -hmm. likely that he will make his claims about 2020 election, the 2022 election, the 2024 election, Mm -hmm. so central Mm -hmm. to his candidacy and so central to the identity of being a trump supporter yeah big question but uh, that was like 10 questions in one karen yeah yes you can Uh, unpack them as you like (laughs) yeah i mean first off i i love that example of you know germany and banning holocaust denial because look at the end of the day you know we're talking about nothing is a blanket nothing should ever be a blanket rule for all time in all contexts that's just no way to (laughs) that's no way to be good nimble humans, right? Uh, I think that there have been many times in history and there ought to continue to be, uh, probably. None of us is a great judge of this because we're not there in the future, but um, there ought to be times and places where we need to take drastic action because there is a potential harm, you know, that we're trying to prevent from some kind of lie, some some bad actors who have gotten too much power. Uh, I think that's that's really the thing, right? Um, in a healthy society, bad actors are a huge minority and don't have that much power. And so everything, everything moves as freely as it should. Um, you know, but I'll say this, I do think that, I do think that a society that has a culture of curiosity, that, that has antibodies, also has antibodies against the infection of bad actors. I think bad actors thrive because we don't listen to each other well enough. I think that's what's happening. Now, I know not everyone will agree with me, but I really believe that. I really see the evidence for that in my own experience as a journalist and as someone who's trying to build bridges where I can is is like, I think that when people go to things that don't have a lot of discipline of fact beneath them, uh, it's because they feel, whether it's true or not, that they can't go anywhere else and be seen and heard that there's some concern that's being unacknowledged. And again, I know that's a very complicated idea, you know, and I would welcome challenges to that because I'm still, I'm still forming all this stuff. I don't have all the answers, but, but I would look forward to a culture where bad actors can't thrive much more than I would look forward to a culture that has to put up walls against its own freedom of expression over and over and over again. That's not the culture I want to be in. And I think, that when we build the glue, when we build the trust, that means that we're seeing each other and we're hearing each other, then a bunch of bullshit won't travel so far because it won't be serving any, it won't be giving anyone that sense that they belong to something, that somebody understands them. I mean, God, you know, bad actors Mm -hmm. are exploiting the fact that people don't feel understood. That's on us. That's on us all of us. That's the harm I've been talking about. This is where we are. We're finding ourselves in a place where we have to make these decisions about, we're a democracy. We're supposed to be an open marketplace of ideas, right? Why aren't we? Well, because we're scared. What are we scared of? Each other. Hold on. Why are we scared of each other if we barely even talk to each other? (laughs) What are we scared of? We're not scared of the people. We're scared of the projections of those people in our minds. We got to fix that. Hmm. Well, shifting gears a little bit to the more practical side, if I'm a listener of this podcast and I don't know if I have the time to read the whole book, what are one or two or three tips to keep in mind as I'm thinking about how can I have 
a curious, productive conversation that right now I am afraid of even having because I think it's going to backfire. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first thing again is I'm not, I'm not saying talk to a Nazi tomorrow. There's a, a wonderful thinker at the Othering and Belonging Institute, uh, John Powell, who has this lovely story that I think is just great, but he talks about how uh, a pastor once asked him, John, are you asking me to bridge with the devil? And John said, well, maybe don't start there. <laughs> and I love that because because again, it's like, we're so afraid of doing this, right? That one of the arguments we have against doing this at all is, I can't do it in this hardest possible way. We are asking me to do it in the heart. No, I'm not. Nobody's asking totally. that. Totally. Nobody's asking that. It's like, you, wherever you are, just one more question in a conversation across some difference, one more conversation you spark, that's enough. That's great. We all do that at scale. We're, we're sitting pretty, like we're doing something good for ourselves. So that's the first thing is again, like don't, you know, for people not to think that the only way to do this is to do it in the hardest possible way. No, <laughs> that's not a thing. Um, yeah, and then as far as a couple of tips, um, you know, honestly, it starts with, at, at Braver Angels, we have a workshop called Depolarizing Within. And, mm -hmm. and really it's, it's inquiry, it's curiosity about oneself. It's catching ourselves in the act of assuming what we don't know. So I recommend, um, you know, the first step doesn't even have to be a conversation with another person. It can be a conversation with yourself. The next time you see an article with a headline that, oh boy, I really don't like this idea. I know this is not gonna be fun. And either you wanna ignore it or you wanna tweet about how awful it is before you read it. You know, we all do that sometimes. Go into the article, read it. And as you read it, ask yourself, can I believe this? Ask yourself, what's the strongest argument they're making? Can you be generous about it? Ask yourself, what's the concern underneath all of this that I recognize? There are answers to those questions. And that is a practice you can do between you and yourself while you read an article by someone else's perspective. And then you're having an actual conversation some issue comes up, oh boy, you're on different sides of this, but, but okay, maybe you're ready to actually try to understand why the other person believes what they believe. A really key thing is not to ask why. And instead mm. of asking why, ask how. How did you come to believe what you believe? When we ask why across divides, again, everything's in context and the context is fear and mistrust. Asking why puts people on the stand, makes them feel like they have to justify who they are. That, that justifying what they believe is the same as justifying who they are. They will do anything to do that successfully. Grab any talking point they can, you know, exaggerate, bloviate, and then you'll do that back to them and it won't be pretty. So instead, ask how did you come to believe what you believe? Uh, ask them to tell you a story instead of sit in judgment of each other. Maybe you can do that later. I mean, debate is a wonderful thing to do, but you need a little bit of trust first. So just, just walk alongside them the path they took to their views. Um, and the last one I, I'll say is concerns. Um, I, I have found in my, all my years as a journalist that asking people for their concerns is one of the most powerfully curious questions that you can ask. Because first off, often we, we embed uh, judgment and assumptions into our questions, you know? Why do you believe something so racist? <laughs> you know, is one of those kind of accusatory right. questions. But what concerns you? What concerns you about uh, what's happening to businesses downtown during these protests? What's the ultimate concern for you? Is a better question, right? Um, and when you when you do that, you collect people's concerns, and the magic that happens is that our concerns reveal our values. You know, maybe there's a value for. I don't know, there's a value for sort of um, the, the collective security. There's a value for um, making sure that uh, people are not harmed. That's a beautiful value, right? And, and we do share those values. We just end up stacking them in a different order for different issues, but we do share them. So it's a wonderful way to get to conversations of common ground. Again, like I, I've had conversations with a relative of mine who I love dearly, who you know, does not vaccinate her child, does not vaccinate herself, will never do it. I could choose to have the conversation with her about that, just constantly being like, why not? Why not? Here's an article. Here's another one. Oh my gosh, like, right. why are you doing this? 
this is terrible. I could choose to do that, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, I love her and I'm not going to do that. And that's just not the way I see her. So instead, we've had amazing conversations about her values around nature and what she sees as natural and unnatural, what she trusts and doesn't trust. She doesn't trust wealth. She doesn't trust big corporate power. Um, you know, she, she is one of the healthiest people I know. So, you know, if I came at her going like, you don't care about health, well, that's obviously not true. She cares about health. She has a different construction of that. And it's led her to some conclusions that I think are wrong. But we don't talk about the conclusions. We talk underneath that and we learn from each other. And I'm really grateful that, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people have these kinds of situations in their own lives. Our, our temptation is to, we have one of those conversations, we try, it's really hard, it doesn't go where we want it to go, and so we burn the bridge. I'm never talking to my relative again. But then what you lose is what if one day that relative, you know, and let's assume for the sake of the, the, the example that they do believe something, they, they, have, they believe a conclusion that is wrong. What if that relative one day gets curious and humble, you know, because it takes a lot of humility to question oneself, to be like, maybe I am wrong, I don't know. Maybe this is worth questioning. Maybe I should call my relative because we've had good conversations about this before and I have felt seen and heard by them. But they can't do that now because you've burned that bridge. Hmm. So that's also what we lose. At what point can curiosity veer into sort of like voyeurism? Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes people go into conversations and I'm not sure if they're curiosity comes from a genuine mm. desire to sort of see someone as they are but sort of more of like i can't wait to see like the crazy shit that this person says <laughs> right you know and yeah, that's i lawyers, think really fe fed by the media and mm. twitter and i think a, a lot of times people can almost kind of confuse those two things because when you're being voyeuristic you don't have to take that risk and be yeah. vulnerable. You're already sort of just putting yourself above the other person. Exactly. Um, how can people sort of like take that risk to maybe move from like a voyeur to someone mm -hmm. who's legitimately curious and willing to respond when yeah. the other person says, well, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I think you, you kind of have the answer in the question because yeah, because you were saying you, you put yourself above the other person. That's when it's voyeurism. That's when it's mm -hmm. that's when curiosity isn't isn't what I'm talking about when I'm talking about curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean? uh, it's exactly that. It's it's when um, it's when we we get it's when it's about condescension. It's when condescension is in our hearts, and we're curious because like I don't know, it, you know, almost like researchers going, "Ooh, look at this." Look at this gross society. Let me make, let me take some notes. Right. You know, that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. That's gross. And we do we we do do that to each other sometimes, but that's not curiosity. That's condescension. And so you have to start by you have to start by believing that this other person matters just as much as you. And if you can't do that, get to where you can. Totally. And I think we we derive so much of our self-conception from how we see ourselves in relation to and in comparison with other people. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when people see themselves as superior to others, what they're actually doing is projecting parts of themselves that they don't like yeah. onto other people. Yeah. And Definitely. then saying I'm feeling superior to this person mm. um has that sort of like deeper psychological projection stuff manifested for you when you've been like analyzing these conversations because mm -hmm. I've noticed that even within myself like mm -hmm. why is like what this person is doing bothering me so much right now right yeah. if you really dig in the surface it's like oh maybe that's something that like I kind of do and I really don't like it. And that's yeah, a really like yeah. uncomfortable place to be. It's extremely uncomfortable. I, and, and it has, it has manifested. I'm really glad you brought it up because it does come back to psychology. It's so much easier to externalize everything, which is why, you know, we're, we're mostly in the habit of blaming the media, blaming the politicians for all of this. It's like, 
We see, we see ourselves as passive victims of this division. Um, but, but no, I mean, what, how we react to other people's beliefs is almost more fertile ground for curiosity. Uh, yeah, I think about anger in particular. Um, Valerie Cower, an author who I really respect, um, she wrote the book See No Stranger, which I highly recommend. And uh, you know, she says anger is a force that protects that which is loved. And so mm. if you catch yourself getting angry, that's interesting. That's interesting. You know, you can ask mm -hmm. yourself, why am I angry? Or if you see someone else being angry, you know, usually again, the temptation is I'm out, <laughs> like this is too much. And, and maybe it is, and absolutely take a break or, or be done if it's just too much, the heat's turned up, turned up too high and nothing's cooking. We don't want that. We don't want things to burn. We want things to cook. So, but, but anger doesn't have to be a reason to shut down a conversation. Anger can be content of a conversation. If you sense yourself being angry, you can almost be aware and be like, oh, wow, hang on. I apparently really care about this. Wonder why, mm. you know, you yeah. know, it's this, it's that, it's this concern. It's that concern. Yeah. The concept of anger reminds me of something I heard John Roush say, and I think he would admit that he was generalizing, but he said something like the dominant emotion on the right is anger. The mm. dominant emotion on the left is contempt. Wow. What do you think about that idea? Have you sort of wow. within the red blue divide kind of seen a difference in terms of that negative partisanship energy? Is it, is it different? Mm. Is, is that kind of what the difference is? I'm sure that it is different. I don't feel myself qualified to characterize it. Uh, I think that, I think that sort of pronouncements about the behavior or dominant things about either side of the divide. I just always take with huge grains of salt because none of us occupies a place of being able to look at it very objectively or fully, which is not to dismiss, you know, John Rauch or others who make pronouncements probably from a place of far more like perceptive. I don't know, but I, I would not be very confident about that myself. I can say that as soon as you said that, I kind of nodded in recognition. That makes sense. Mm. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, contempt and anger. It, it just makes me wonder, the, the gap that opens up for me is like, what is the difference? It, it, contempt is aimed at others, but, but isn't anger? Anger is also aimed at others. Contempt is more condescending, but anger I think can be contempt is kind of the belief in like the utter worthlessness yeah. of the object of your contempt. Right, right. right. Uh, whereas anger is more about rage. Yeah. Indignation, uh, uh, protecting yeah. uh, yourself from violation. Yeah. And I, you know, we all kind of armchair psychologists sometimes. And, and I'm, I've always been fascinated by the phenomenon of Donald Trump and Trumpism and, uh, you know, kind of Trump, Trump the man, because there's sort of like Trumpism, you know, which some people could define as sort of this kind of like, like pugnacious populism, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, sicken it to the liberals, turning over the apple cart, kind of yeah. standing up. For, um, and, and then there's, you know, people who say they like held their nose and voted for Trump. Like, I don't like the way he tweets, but, you know, I like that he's a businessman or I, I like uh, this or people who will say, you know, look, I'm deeply pro-life and Donald Trump put three Supreme Court justices on the court and that's why I voted for him. Um, and then there's, I think, a lot of people who just love his whole thing, yeah. right? Like they love um, the way he operates as a politician, the way mm -hmm. that, that he- um, My dad loves that. Yeah, no, I, I, I know. Yeah. Right. No. And, and, and so it's like interesting thinking about like, what are the sort of um, traits that make people really attracted to that sort of like figure right. and that sort of right. strong man? And what yeah. are the traits that, because uh, some people are just so naturally repulsed, right? Like you, some people will see yeah. like Trump on screen and they're just like, oh, I hate that guy like every you know everything and then some people are like 
give me more, like inject yeah. that into my veins. Right. Yeah. And what do you think is, what are those sort of like traits or personalities yeah. you think that kind of like flip that binary? Yeah. I mean, having talked to my dad about this and you know that I tend to turn these things into what's fascinating. So I'm going to do that now. Um, he and I have had really interesting discussions about this. So when I was growing up and I, I even read about this in the book, uh, I watched a lot of movies. And the reason I watched a lot of movies is because my parents watched a lot of movies. We'd go to the movie theater every weekend. I thought it was normal. It was not normal. Um, but we would see movies twice, whatever. And just like always go to the movies. Uh, so my dad and, and my whole family is just like motivated by story and drama and conflict. And, everything. and the reason this is interesting or, or that ties into what I'm going to say is uh, I've talked to my dad about, all right, give it to me. Like, what, what do you see in Trump that's really exciting? Like, yeah, give me, give me that strongest argument from your, from your place. And I remember he talked about the character uh, of House. Do you ever watch the show House about the doctor? It's a wonderful yeah. show about a, a, an ER doctor who is an absolute genius and can diagnose uh, the most mysterious diseases. And they built this great show and the actor whose name escapes me for the moment is fantastic. But the entire show, he drives everyone in the hospital leadership completely crazy. He refuses to follow rules. He refuses to respect other people the way they probably ought to be respected so that he can save that patient. He sees it like a clinical, it's all a puzzle, right? Like they, they draw out his character, it's fascinating. And, and he's so driven by that. He's not like a particularly nice guy at all, but he saves lives. And, and in the show, he often saves lives because he breaks the rules, because he doesn't care about the bureaucracy, because he doesn't care about his relationship with so-and-so. He just cares about the work. In a lot of ways, my dad saw that uh, saw that in Trump a bit. That that Trump is is up here, seeing some of the things that I have been aggravated by, you know. And my dad's a Mexican immigrant, right? But he's been aggravated by the fact that the United States doesn't enforce its own immigration laws well enough. He hates that, and I could tell you why. You know, I could tell you some of his story that explains some of that to me. But um, so he sees Trump come along and just in a no nonsense way be like, enough of that enough. He loved that. And I can see why he loved that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, in our last couple minutes here, I guess I would just ask you, what do you hope the impact of this book is? I mean, I think it's already starting to make some waves. I saw it was number one bestseller in the social sciences on Amazon. Uh yeah. reviewed in the New York Times. I know you're doing a ton of press. You're about to, you know, travel around the country. Um, what, what do you hope is the impact? You know, what I, what I often say, and, and this is still very true, is that it inspires people to just be one bit more curious. Uh, again, not to think as people often do, and it really stops, the, <laughs> stops things, not to think that, oh gosh, they're asking me to do this horrible, horrible, hard thing. No, we're not. Nobody's asking that. Just one more question, one more step. Um, but something I've been thinking about this week as well is we just haven't really been talking about the importance of questioning our own opinions. We haven't really been talking that much about the importance of, of being aware of, of our identifications with opinions and how that makes it so very difficult to see the person underneath. It makes it difficult, by the way, for each of us to be seen by others too. This isn't just about me seeing others. This is about others seeing me. And it is such a fundamental human need, you know, th th this kind of connection, something like that. And so I I'm also really hopeful that, that we can advance that conversation. I, like I said, I do not, I did not write this book because I think I have the answers. That is not why I wrote this book. I wrote this book because I think that all of us can ask more impactful and more powerful questions of ourselves and of each other. That's really why I wrote it. So this is a conversation that's just beginning and I'm really excited uh, to learn from anyone who wants to jump in. Um, Cause it's just, it's, it's not, this is not a contained conversation. This is out there, you know? So let's, let's get into it. Hmm. Yes, the conversation continues. 
Uh, once again, the book is called, I'm putting it up here on the screen for those watching on YouTube. I never thought of it that way. How to have fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. People can find it on Amazon. People can also follow Monica's work on Twitter and at Braver Angels and on this very podcast. She is sometimes a host, sometimes a guest. And I'd love to hear what folks thought about this episode. And for any listeners who are inspired, I'd love for you guys to go out and try to have one curious conversation, Mm -hmm. maybe inspired by this conversation, maybe using some of the tips Monica's come up with and let us know how it went. Mm -hmm. And maybe in a future episode, we can dive into some of those stories um, because it's the stories that make meaning and the stories that are ultimately going to shape our collective future. So Mm -hmm. here's to a more curious and compassionate future and conversation. Yes. Love it. Until next time, take care.